Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Today we are going to talk about cardiac output and we are going to get oriented what actually are the factors that is determining the cardiac output and also certain clinical correlation to the cardiac output. So cardiac output. Cardiac output by definition. If we have to define cardiac output, it is the amount of blood that is pumped by the ventricles per minute. So the amount of the blood that both the ventricle separately they are pumping per minute is called as the cardiac output. The cardiac output it is about 5 liters per minute. Now here the point we have to remember is that both the ventricles pump exactly the same cardiac output means same amount of blood in a normal healthy person it is never that the left ventricle if it is pumping 5 liter of blood per minute it is never that the right ventricle will pump even 0.1 ml or point like one liter of blood more or less if it happens then it will lead to different kind of congestion okay so it is exactly the same amount of blood exactly the same amount of blood now the formula to compute or that represent the cardiac output it is a product of heart rate and stroke volume it is heart rate and stroke volume so roughly we know that say in a normal adult the heart rate is about say 72 beats per minute and say the stroke volume as we know it's like 70 to 80 so let's assume it is 70 it is 70 ml per beat so it stands out to approximately 5 liter per minute that's how it works this is our cardiac output now, what are the various ways to measure cardiac output? There are various methods, numerous methods to measure the cardiac output, though now we use only the most accurate ones. But when this whole measurement process of cardiac output started, there evolved more than one method. The first method, which also happens to be the most accurate method but but one of the most accurate method but it is invasive it is invasive so it is painful it's no more in use but the first one was by the fixed principle so in fixed principle there is always like difference of the content right as we so in case of diffusion also so by using the fixed principle how did we measure the cardiac output it was like calculating cardiac output was like calculating total body consumption of the oxygen by the difference of the oxygen content in the arterial blood and concentration of oxygen in the venous blood so this is the total body oxygen content or quantity this is the concentration of oxygen in the arterial blood that is the oxygenated blood and why it's different from the concentration of oxygen in the mixed blood or venous blood they both mean the same 
So this was the process. But here the limitation was that by this process it is invasive. A dye has to be injected and then the sample of the blood has to be again withdrawn and again the measurement has to be done. So it was very painful. So this became obsolete. It was no more in use. The second method is the thermo dilution method or the dye indicator method. So, the thermo dilution method, what was that? Here, here, the thermo dilution method, here, the dye that is thiano, thiano sine. Sine was used and a cold saline was okay. In the thermodilution method, of course, the thermodilution method here the cold saline was used, and the dye indicator if there was an indicator, a dye which was the thinocyanine, the green one, the first one that we spoke about. This is actually like two methods that we are clubbing it up and talking because this is no more in use. So, we just have a rough idea what it was. It is not in use. So, specifically in the dye indicator, dye indicator method, a formula was used. A formula was used which is a Hamilton Stewart formula. So, the formula was like, like it was like Q ml of the dye into the constant 60 by the concentration of the dye which dye that green thiocyanine that one into the time or duration of the dye in the curve. So, this was also like full of error because here first the dye had to be injected, then again sample had to be collected and then graph had to be plotted and just seeing the point on which the graph is lying, the concentration of the dye had to be understood and indirectly the cardiac output was measured. That was the formula for the dye indicator method. Just have an idea what it was. You don't have to be very serious about this method. Okay. So, this was the dye indicator method which was painful and gave a lot of wrong results. So, it became obsolete. The other one that is the thermal dilution. So, in thermal dilution, what happened? 0.9% of NaCl at like 4 second at a rate of 4 second about 10 ml was injected into the right atrium so this because we are, we were injecting a cold saline it was injected through a catheter now injection was done through a catheter which had a thermi store. Now, thermi store it has the capacity to change to sense the change in the temperature. So, when from the right atrium, this cold saline was going into the circulation like normal cold saline at room temperature. It was going and it was circulating. So, by the by the difference in temperature, the heart rate, stroke volume and ultimately cardiac output was calculated. 
but again this was this process was also full of errors so that also did not give an appropriate re report or appropriate and finding of the cardiac output it was full of error and it became an obsolete the third one was the doppler eco cardiogram doppler doppler cardiogram so here the real time imaging like real time through that software through that uh, machine that real time imaging was done and cardiac output was computed that also had not so much of correct result ultimately the most accurate one and the most accepted one is the magnetic resonance imaging that is mri this is the most accurate and hassle free method and this is what is like accepted now this is what is like mostly in current practice now it not only gives the understanding of the cardiac output it also does the imaging of the pulmonary arteries the arteries the valves the condition of the heart everything we get the picture we get the image in the most precise way in the most accurate way which is the mri and this is the method which is most in use to get correct understanding or idea about the cardiac output that is happening in a person because if we understand cardiac output definitely we will have the idea about the heart rate and the stroke volume so this was the method this is like just for your knowledge it is nothing to be so much hard about it okay now what factor we have to remember very well and very thoroughly are the determinants are the determinants of cardiac output so what did we understand we saw that we studied that cardiac output it is a product of the heart rate and stroke volume okay so any factor and every factor that affects the heart rate and stroke volume will have a direct effect on the heart rate and stroke volume okay it is supposed to have a direct effect in heart rate and stroke volume one by one we will understand these factors but overall overall what do we see overall say for example during exercise when we are exercising the cardiac output it increases obviously obviously it increases okay so when the cardiac output increases what does happen when the cardiac output increases the heart rate increases and stroke volume also increases but it is seen that it is seen that going to be noted usually in increased cardiac output the increase in the the increase in the heart rate is more and increase in the stroke volume is slight means both will increase whenever a person is exercising the cardiac output increases now there are two determinants that is the heart rate and the stroke volume so here when the cardiac output is increasing the heart rate also increases the stroke volume also increases but the increase in the heart rate is much more compared to increase in the stroke volume now this increase happens as long as long as heart rate is equal to or lesser than 160 beats per minute now once the heart rate 
it is within like 160 or just below 160 then increase in the heart rate increase in the cardiac output will cause increase in the heart rate and slight increase in the stroke volume okay after that after that after that that is that is like heart rate greater than 160 beats per minute what will happen there will be there will be decrease in the cardiac output there will be decrease in the cardiac output now, this is what is stated by the frank stalley law that are until or until a certain heart rate there will be increase in the pumping of the heart like heart rate is increasing the heart is also pumping faster and there is more blood that is being pumped out but as soon as that physiological limit is crossed then the cardiac output will decrease because the heart cannot pump more blood to the periphery so once the heart rate is greater than 160 beats per minute the cardiac output starts falling now when the cardiac output starts falling here what happens the drop in stroke volume is more than the drop in heart rate so when the what is the take what we have to remember when the cardiac output is more heart is beating faster the heart rate is increasing more than how much the stroke volume is increasing so cardiac output is equal to like product of the heart rate and stroke volume so increase and decrease in the cardiac output will increase and decrease the heart rate true but when the cardiac output i'm repeating is increasing the heart rate is increasing more compared to the stroke volume it's not that the stroke volume is not increasing it is also increasing but the heart rate is increasing more now opposite happens when the cardiac output is dropping so when the heart reaches to a heart beat of 160 beats per minute at that time the cardiac output starts dropping so when the drop in the cardiac output happens that time the stroke volume decreases faster decreases more decreases much quicker compared to that of the decrease in the heart rate this is a point that we have to remember understanding the modulating affecting and maneuvering capacities of the heart rate and stroke volume on the cardiac output so determinants of the cardiac output we start with heart rate the heart rate what is heart rate what causes what causes the heart rate heart rate it is caused due to the firing from the sno this is what we have understood right it is caused due to the firing from the sa node so how many ever times the firing will happen it will give to the heart rate it will cause the heart beat that is the heart rate so heart rate it is in it has rather it has impact from the sympathetic and para sympathetic innervations now when we study the innervation to the heart what did we study to as a note there is branches of sympathetic nerve and parasympathetic nerve both right so the sympathetic nerve and parasympathetic nerve both have effect on the impulse generating sa node or on the space maker of the heart that is the sa node so now these are the direct effect other than that we will study later there are two reflexes also which is called the barrow receptor the reflex now baroreceptor reflex this also has a very strong impact on the heart 
rate. Okay, these are the main factors that have impact on the heart rate. Now, how does it have impact on the heart rate? Like stimulation from the sympathetic innervation to the SA node. What will it do? It will increase the heart rate. Whereas stimulation from or like overdrive from the parasympathetic innervation to the SC node, what it will do? It will decrease the heart rate. Okay, I'm talking about the normal condition. We're not talking about any clinical condition. Though. So, whenever there is increase in the heart rate, we call it tachycardia. In an adult, tachycardia it is like 100 beats per minute and more. Right? So, the term is tachycardia. And the cutoff is 100 beats per minute and above. Bradycardia is what we call when the heart rate is decreased. Bradycardia. In an adult, the cutoff is 60 beats per minute. These are usually effect on the heart rate. So, obviously, Anakor, do you have telegram channel? Anakor, the telegram channel, yes, uh, Dr. Bhanu sir has. You can subscribe to that and you can get all these videos with the notes. So, how does heart rate then impact? So, cardiac output, again, heart rate into stroke volume. So, anything that will increase heart rate will go and increase the cardiac output. Anything, anything that decreases the heart rate will go and decrease the cardiac output. So, this is how they are related. Heart rate we have understood. Now, the second determinant is the stroke volume. Very important determinant. All are important, but why stroke volume makes it little bit more critical? Because unlike the heart rate, the factors that are altering or affecting stroke volume is like multiple. Now, stroke volume. What do we know stroke volume? In the cardiac cycle, what did we study? So, every time the heart is ejecting the ventricles, I mean, of course, the ventricles are ejecting blood per beat. Per beat means the fraction that is going from the end astrolic volume to the periphery is the stroke volume. Is the stroke volume. So, stroke volume accounts for the ejection fraction and we have also studied this ejection fraction or myocardial contractility it decreases in any disease of the heart and usually it is 40 to 70 right so if it is decreased means it is there is problem with the contraction of the heart okay a stroke volume, it also has multiple factor that is affecting and altering the stroke volume. So, if we write stroke volume, the factors affecting stroke volume are Preload, contractility, and after load. Okay. Now, preload. Preload is what? Preload is our end diastolic volume. Preload is our end diastolic volume. Contractility, contractility is nothing. It is the force of contraction, which we 
also known as ionotropin and afterload what is afterload it is the very peril resistance against which the ventricles pump blood okay now this three we will understand one by one in details so first is the concept of the three load so talking about free load if there is any increase in the pre load automatically there will be increase in the end diastolic volume so increase in the end diastolic volume what if you remember from the diagram like in the cardiac output in the cardiac cycle we have seen like if the end diastolic volume is more the end diastolic volume is more then what will happen there will be increase in the stretching of the cardiac muscle fiber there will be increase in the stretching of the cardiac muscle fiber now this increase in the stretching of the cardiac muscle fiber with the help of the calcium with the help of the calcium plus calcium it will lead to more over lapping of actin and myosin okay because it is stretched it is it is like stretched now when there is more overlapping of the actin and the myosin obviously obviously it will it will increase the contraction force or force of contraction and it will eject more blood to the periphery and also to the lung very here we are talking about the left ventricle mainly so if the end diastolic volume is more the preload is more and that will increase the force of contraction now this principle or this phenomenon has been described as in frank starling law so frank starling law okay what does it state it states that increase in the preload increases end diastolic volume causes increase in the stroke volume ultimately increase in the cardiac output this is what the frank starling law says now this it has been represented by a graphical presentation but the frank starling law also mentions a crucial point that this increase in the preload which increases the end diastolic volume and it increases it will increase the stroke volume ultimately it will increase cardiac output ultimately there will be more blood pumped out to the periphery as well as to the lung now all this mechanism which is the frank starling law it happens within normal physiological limit so let's understand the graph to understand this point so on our on our x axis on our x axis we have the we have the preload preload which is also the end diastolic volume and on the y axis 
we have the stroke volume or cardiac output because both of them they mean the same so what it states that the frank starling law it is something the curve is something like that that within physiological limit whenever there is as you can see whenever there is increase in the preload as the preload is increasing there is there is more blood being pumped by the ventricles this is what the law states but again if you look carefully at it this also after climbing for some time it has a plateau there is a plateau there is a flattening of region anything that has a flattened in a curve it means that a point comes when the increase is no more so here you see from here right after here we see the plateau the static form in the curve is beyond this point what does it mean it means that after this point after if you are drawing a vertical line so after this volume of the preload means that quantity of the blood a certain quantity of the blood beyond that quantity if there is more blood entering to the ventricle no matter how much more blood it enters to the ventricle then the ventricle will not contract in a way that it can pump more blood that is the physiological limit so numerically it is seen that up to 200 to 220 ml of the end diastolic volume the frank charling law x beyond 200 ml or 220 ml if the end diastolic volume we know how much is end diastolic volume usually end diastolic volume is between 130 to 150 ml right so from this quantity suppose due to any reason the venous return has increased due to some uh, veno uh, constriction anything any reason some venous uh, return has increased more blood has come to the right, right atrium so if more blood comes to the right atrium obviously more blood will come to the left atrium so when venous return increases and say from 130 to 150 that is a normal from there all the way the preload or the end diastolic volume increases to 160 170 180 200 or max to 220 as long as this is happening more blood the force of contraction will increase and there will be more blood pumped to the periphery and the lungs but once the end diastolic volume crosses that physiological limit crosses that physiological limit then this frank stalling law will not work then what will happen if suppose through venous return the end diastolic volume has become 240 or 250 then the excess amount of blood that is being coming to the ventricle will just stay in the ventricle will stay in the ventricle it will not get pumped out because here the plateau area has started here the frank starling law is failed has stopped working even though the blood volume is more in the ventricle no more blood is being pumped to the periphery so this is what the frank starling law says now this frank starling law it also has effect from certain drugs from certain agents agents means drug so it is seen that say for example this is the point this is a point n okay this is the point n or rather so this is the max point So this is the point n so this is the point from which the normal frank starling law is acting here if something some agents like epinephrine or uh, agonist of epinephrine if they are used then it is seen that the frank starling law climbs up like this 
means it increases it goes above the prime starling law increases so from compared to the normal one it just goes above in case of opposite condition if there is any situation in which the venous return has decreased or by usage of certain drug the venous return and the cardiac output has been made to decrease the end diastolic volume has been made to decrease then the frank starling law comes down but the point from which they are functioning are on the same line okay just remember very simply this more details of it we will study when we do like other clinical related topics so i repeat what do i mean by this this is also called the starling curve like the blue one as you see it is a normal frank starling curve so in the frank starling curve say n is the point from which the heart is pumping normal amount of blood depending on the pre load now if some agent some drugs like epinephrine or agonist of epinephrine or say simply the person is exercising in this condition this frank starling law it will go up the starling curve it will go up than the normal now opposite happens due to some reason there is some problem in the blood vessel so there is some constriction in the blood vessel in the periphery or due to some reason the venous return has decreased so venous return has decreased means there will be less preload so in this case the curve will go down but the point because it is not an abnormal or clinical condition so the point will remain in the same line okay it will remain in the same line this is one way how the starling curve is affected how the starling curve is affected okay this is for our orientation regarding the starling curve okay this is starling curve one more thing this is a function of the right of the left side of the heart only of the right side we have the separate kind of curve for the right side of the heart that is what is happening to the cardiac activity on the right atrium and the right ventricle the curve looks something different it is it is a function of the it is a function of the venous return on the y axis it is a function of the venous return in ml and on the x axis this is the pressure in the right atrium mmag so the curve that represents the function the pressure and volume function of the right heart starling frank starling curve or starling curve it is only of the left heart this one is only for the right heart here the curve looks something like this so what does it mean what does it designate it designate that when the pressure is more when the pressure in the right atrium is more the venous return increases the venous return increases whenever the pressure is like less the venous return tends to decrease now in conditions when there are increase or decrease in the diameter of the vena cava diameter of the vena cava say due to some reason the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava not only that or even from the periphery the diameter of the veins which is pushing the blood to the heart the right atrium the venous return to the right atrium it becomes constricted so when it becomes constricted then the curve shifts upward towards the right it shifts upward towards the right that is veno constriction here also say the point we are naming it differently so that we don't get confused with the point at which the heart is functioning say it is a and parallelly 
during veno constriction it is b and suppose due to some reason like uh, usage of some drug or anything there is veno dilation veno dilation the curve will move inside but it will be working on the same line this point is c now when does this veno constriction and this uh, veno dilation happens veno constriction usually happens when there are too much of this epinephrine or substances like epinephrine they act so in veno constriction just a quick note kind of a thing to remember what happens in veno constriction here the diameter of the veins decreases so when the diameter of the vein decreases there will be not much volume of the blood staying in the vein not too much of the blood will stay in the vein right and another thing one term i want you to remember is that venous pooling just writing on the side because that way it's very easy to remember what is venous pooling pool like swimming pool right pool so what is the function of a pool anything that is called a pool is to hold is to hold or to keep something right to accommodate something to hold something so when the blood stays in veins more it is called venous pooling now you know veins have got this valves because our when we are standing or sitting other than lying our feet are directly in touch with the ground the ground has the force of gravity so naturally this peripheral vein they have a tendency to act as a pools for the blood okay so there is a venous pooling whenever our feet is touching the ground there is always tendency for blood to be more in the veins this is called venous pooling now when the diameter of the vein becomes narrow obviously the venous pooling will be less so there is decrease in the venous pooling so since the blood cannot stay in the vein for a long time where will it go nowhere else it will go back to the right atrium via the venous return so there will be increase in the venous return it is what will happen so if we know what is veno constriction opposite will happen in veno dilation so in veno dilation what the diameter of the veins are more if the diameter of the veins are more there are more space for the veins to hold more blood so blood will be more accommodated in the vein and the venous return will drop so that's why depending on the condition there is this movement of this or deviation of this curve upward or downward okay now in a normal person in a normal person the both this curve has to be balanced at the equilibrium for the systemic circulation and the venous return to happen so this is designated something like this this that is the function of the right side of the heart the right one now we will draw the left one so it will be this okay and this is the point of equilibrium so on the y axis on the y axis what do we have this is on the y axis if we are considering the black curve that is the right side it is the venous return and if we consider the left one that is the starling uh, curve the frank starling curve it is the cardiac output or stroke volume on the y axis what does it what does it mean it is the right atrium pressure and if we consider the starling curve what is it it is the end diastolic volume so this 
function of the right heart that is the venous return and the pressure in the right atrium has to be in equilibrium with the systemic circulation pumping capacity of the ventricle means the end diastolic volume and the cardiac output and there is a point which is a point of equilibrium so it is only because the heart is maintaining this point of equilibrium the venous return and the cardiac output is perfectly matched it is perfectly matched because they are working from the point of equilibrium in case of cardiac congestion pulmonary congestion cardiac insufficiency cardiac dysfunction hypertrophy myocardial infarction of course any condition of the heart or any condition that is affecting the heart this point will go up or down so just get oriented to this curve now like detail clinical relation eventually you will come to know okay this is what it is and this is about the uh, one point that is affecting the stroke volume that is the preload that is the preload now there are other factors also that other theories also that increases the preload and decreases the preload not only this uh, stalling curve and the right atrium pressure defines that there are other theories also which explains the increase and the decrease in the preload and maintenance of the preload one such theory is the theory of the skeletal pump or skeletal muscle pump rather that affects the stroke volume here veins have valves right veins have got valves what does this theory say the theory says that during contraction of skeletal muscle during contraction of skeletal muscle the valves what they do the valves wherever they are present they close the valve closes to prevent back to prevent back flow of blood to the veins okay and pushes the blood for venous return so we know that if this is say calf muscle and this is like how the veins are during contraction okay they have got the valves they have got the valves so during the contraction what happens suppose this segment of blood the calf muscle they have squeezed on the veins the veins they kind of come closer and they close and this section of blood it is propelled forward for the towards the right atrium for venous return the veins close the vein that has the valve they closes from the back so that there is no back flow into this section there should not be any black flow into this section that's why this is called the skeletal muscle pump skeletal muscle pump what does it mean it means that whenever the skeletal muscle are contracting the valve gets closed and that column of the blood from that section of the vein is propelled further towards the heart so that the venous return increases now if venous return increases increase in venous return will directly cause increase in stroke volume which in turn will cause increase in cardiac output this is what the skeletal muscle pump theory says about controlling the stroke volume like skeletal muscle there is another pump which is the which is the respiratory 
carry pump. Very simply, what we have to remember? We have to remember that at just now the mechanism and all when we go to respiratory system we'll study in details for now just remember at rest at rest means when we are not breathing we are just it is a gap between the two breaths gap between the two respiration so at rest a pressure of minus 2 mmhg is maintained in the intraleural region. Now, very quickly, this minus 2 mm Hg, what does it mean? It does not mean all the way down to numerical minus 2 mm Hg. It means, it means minus 2 mm Hg lesser than the atmospheric pressure it means 758 mm hg <clears throat> it means 750 mm hg 58 mm hg means atmospheric pressure is 760 mm hg minus 2 mm hg that is 758 mm hg that it lies in the intrapleural region that is the gap between the parietal region as well as the visceral region. Okay. So, so at rest a pressure of minus 2 mm Hg is maintained. Someone says good morning. Yeah, good morning to you too. Okay. Now, what happens during respiration? How this respiratory pump affects the stroke volume? Here, yeah, when we are inspiring, respiration means breathing. Breathing means we are taking in the breath and we are expiring the breath. Breathing in, breathing out. That is a respiration. That is one quiet respiration, which we don't even realize when we are like breathing quietly, right? Not forcefully. So, during, during inspiration so during inspiration what happens we are breathing in so when we are breathing in during inspiration the thoracic cavity expands the lungs expands following the lung the chest wall thoracic cavity expands now when <clears throat> when this thoracic cavity expands the diaphragm also descends it becomes flat so there is like squeezing of the thorax on the on the veins that is on the that is running adjoining to the thoracic cavity and when this increase in the volume in the thorax happens there is decrease in the intra pleural pressure how much was it maintaining when at rest it was maintaining minus 2 mm Hg. now when it is like expanding it decreases to minus 6 mm Hg. that is 754 mm Hg. now this decrease in the interpleural pressure they give a thrush they give a push to the blood to go more into the right atria so this one it increases the venous turn so when it increases the venous return it automatically increases the stroke volume and ultimately the cardiac output is increased Okay, this is how the respiration does. So, if during inspiration this has happened, opposite happens during expiration. Okay, so during expiration there is slight decrease in the cardiac output. During inspiration there is slight increase in the cardiac output. Okay, this is how the respiratory pump controls the stroke volume. So, three main control system. One is 
knowing the frank starling law when it comes to stroke volume the first determinant or the first factor controlling the stroke volume is understanding the starling curve and the frank starling law as we saw in the graph then comes the theory of the pump that is a respiratory pump and second is the skeletal pump skeletal pump respiratory pump lastly is the hetero metric and homo metric regulation of stroke volume so this heterometric and homometric regulation of the stroke volume is that when there is no change in the length of cardiac fibers like muscle fibers it is called homometric regulation that means the alteration of the stroke volume includes no change in the cardiac muscle length of the fibers of the ventricles and when there is change in the length of the cardiac muscle fibers it is called heterometric regulation okay so these are the three main ways by which the stroke volume is controlled is affected is maintained next comes the second factor that controls the stroke volume is the con tractility comes the contractility okay <clears throat> Here, let us again understand by the Starling curve. So, a normal Starling curve, it is on the y-axis, on the x-axis, it is the preload, and the y-axis, so it is the stroke volume. So, the force of contractility curve is like that. Again, the Frank Starling law. And here, so this is the point from which the normal the heart is functioning, maintaining the contractility. So this is a normal endpoint. So anything, agents, agents like xanthine or theophylline or even caffeine, agents like xanthine and derivatives of xanthine, caffeine. Or anti arrhythmic drugs act as positive ionotropics. So, here what will happen? Here the force of contractility will increase. Okay, the force of contractility will increase and 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 the curve will move upward same thing that we studied in the frank stunning i'm doing it again so that we can understand agents like or sub situations like hyper apnea not anti-arrhythmic drug it will be epinephrines analog it's better hypercapnia hypoxia anything that will depress the myocardial contractility or 
the presence of ionotropy or antagonist to epinephrine and norepinephrine both what they will do they will decrease the contractility so the curve will move downwards okay this is one point that we already studied another point any factor any factor which is new any factor that increases the preload if n is the point in which the preload is normal and the heart is pumping is having an optimal contractility to maintain the cardiac output now in due to any condition say venous return has increased the preload has increased then also the contractility will increase so that the cardiac output is adjusted it becomes more so in that case in the same normal curve the line of the line the point on which this heart will function will go will go to like slightly up say this is an same if due to any reason any congestion any kind any situation of the veins say the preload has decreased the preload has decreased then also the force of contraction will be less to adjust with the preload and the point will be on the same line same uh, stalling curve but the point will be below so at various situations at various situations the point on the stalling curve will adjust in such a way so that the contractility can adjust with the stroke volume so usually what is the outcome of it the outcome of it is that increase in contractility or very simply positive iono tropy positive ionotropy induces induces increase in the stroke volume examples we have seen okay here decrease in decrease in contractility due to physiological condition due to clinical condition or due to as it is effect of the drugs negative ionotropy what it will do it will decrease the stroke volume so contractility and stroke volume they also are directly having a relation so stroke volumes first determinant preload we understood okay second point the second determinant or the second important factor that is contractility that also we have understood now in case of a failing heart what do we do this is for your knowledge for in a case of a failing heart okay failing heart means anything that will reduce the anything that will reduce the contractility or the pumping capacity of the ventricle very simply very in a very precise manner just remember whenever there is any failing heart that means the ventricle is not able to pump as much or as efficiently as it should so if the ventricles are not able to pump as efficiently as it should then the cardiac output and stroke volume everything is affected so the blood going to the periphery is less cardiac output is put is low so here the curve becomes something like this in case of a failing heart heart failure now the heart tries its level best to pump more blood to the circulation so that there is no shortage of the blood in the circulation in the periphery it tries to maintain the cardiac output but in doing so it has to do more more mechanical work it has to pump more actively so the point the point at which it should work it moves to moves to a point which is way which is like way more than the point normal point it should maintain it is a case of a heart failure 
that means the heart is not having enough force of contraction enough contractility to pump out more blood now in this condition what do we do we in failing heart to improve the contractility we administer drugs like digoxin drugs like digoxin so that the contractility increases so when the drug like digoxin is administered just know the fact it is just an orientation for you guys just know when drugs like digoxin is administered so what happens this curve this failing heart curve it moves slightly up it moves slightly up but it does not go back to the end go back to the normal this is like after digoxin and administration so digoxin digitalis this kind of drug what they do they in they act as positive inotropic okay they increase they increase the heart rate the force of contraction they increase mainly the force of contraction so here there will be slight knee correction of the stalling curve but it will not be totally corrected so as you can see from the fading curve it has gone slightly upwards but it has not gone completely above it has not gone completely above the line it has not gone back to the end okay it has gone to a point like where it is not the failing heart but it is not the normal heart curve also okay this is a function of the decoxin so this is all like the stalling curves that affects the contractility so the take from here is that this contractility can be altered during physiological condition during pathological condition and also by administration of the drug so contractility also has a very important effect or impact on the stroke volume so we understood preload and the theories that affects the preload and then we understood the contractility all okay the last one is the after load now after load what does after load mean after load it means it means the resistance it means the resistance against which the ventricles are pumping blood say for example if uh, there is any atherosclerosis in any of the arteries in the periphery if there is any constriction of the blood vessel now usually it is arterioles that offer resistance more in normal condition in normal physiological condition let's write it in normal physiological condition the arterioles are the resistant vessels additionally additionally if additionally if there is any constriction or any blockage to any blood vessel in the periphery then it will increase the after load it will increase the after load and increase in after load will directly decrease the stroke volume now after load is one of the most determinant and important factor that affects the stroke volume so if stroke volume is affected 
by or regulated by preload contractility and after load then we need to remember then it is after load that impacts or that has impact on stroke volume maxima okay if we try to draw it it will be the stroke volume this is our stroke volume in the middle this is after load this is pre load and say this is contractility so these are the three factors that is affecting on determining the stroke volume right so pre load what we have seen it is always the pre load increase or decrease say for example in a situation there has been more venous return more venous return say there is increase in the preload so increase in the preload what it will do it will increase it will increase the it will stimulate or it will increase the stroke volume increase in the contractility what it will do it will increase the stroke volume okay but but increase in the afterload what it will do it will directly decrease the stroke volume if there is a situation suppose the venous return has increased the force of contraction has increased yet there is a resistance there is a constriction in the periphery in any of the blood vessel in the periphery then also the stroke volume will decrease so even if there is a situation in which preload is more contractility has increased but the after load has increased then the total outcome will be decrease in the stroke volume so just let's write it down it is like if pre load and contractility increases but after load also increases then stroke volume will decrease because after load has a inverse relation to the stroke okay. and what effects or what controls after load factors determining after load are total peripheral resistance very important factor total peripheral resistance means if there is any resistance any blockage any hindrance any constriction in any of the blood vessel in any of the arteries in the periphery means any of the arteries that is supplying blood to the organs or any further constriction of the arterioles this is called total peripheral resistance which is also known as known as systemic vascular resistance so we call it systemic vascular resistance also or total peripheral resistance total peripheral resistance and or hormones in circulation how hormones in circulation because hormones like catecholamines catecholamines especially epinephrine and norepinephrine you know they are like uh, and also angiotensin 2 so those kind of hormones they are very potent vasoconstrictor so if they are present in the circulation more there will be vasoconstriction vasoconstriction it will increases total peripheral resistance okay 
So this is our control of the stroke volume and stroke volume. If stroke volume is altered, cardiac output will also be altered. So in this session, what did we get oriented to? We got oriented to what is cardiac output. We got oriented to the methods of measuring of the cardiac output and the determining factors which are the heart rate and stroke volume and what controls or impacts the heart rate which is the branches of the autonomous system sympathetic parasympathetic sympathetic has the increasing property increase in sympathetic innovation overflow will increase the heart rate overflow from the parasympathetic innovation will decrease the heart rate stroke volume it is impacted by the preload preload again we have understood the theories and diastolic volume maintained by the and how it is controlled and affected by the Stalling curves, Franz Stalling law. Then we understood its uh, in, uh, impact by the pumps, respiratory skeletal muscle, and also by the heterometric and the homometric regulation. And then the contractility, the agents, the condition that increases and decreases contractility, and we saw it in the Stalling curve also. How it is impacted in heart failure and how what is the role of the decoxin we had the orientation of that the main orientation of those we had then we understood the role of afterload even if stroke volume and contractility increases yet the <clears throat> if the preload and the contractility increases yet the stroke volume will be impacted if the afterload is more so for what is the take of it for stroke volume to increase, afterload has to be always less. Afterload has to be always less. Okay, so this is our orientation from the cardiac output. Tomorrow we'll have the last session of cardiovascular system in which we will understand the arterial blood pressure regulation and neutral regulation. Okay, see you all tomorrow. Thank you.